I'm going to talk about um, hardware inference accelerators for machine learning. So this is this is a um, a topic that's actually you know growing in, in interest across lots of lots of the segments of the communities that I think many of us are, are working in. So think of this as a talk sort of across two domains. So you know part of this is a, um, a nitty gritty hardware talk. So this is a talk about custom accelerators. Um, and part of this is to talk about machine learning, which is a broad area of technology that's getting lots and lots of traction um, across lots of consumer and industrial applications, but also showing up as a tool, a technical tool that people in our space is actually using. And so you're going to see me flipping back and forth between my hardware guy hat and my relatively recent machine learning guy hat. So let's start with just the sort of the left-hand side of the, of the slide. Custom accelerators, you know, why, why are people doing this? And the basic answer is we have been um, blessed with the opportunity to ride Moore's Law, right, for the last 40 or so years, and sorry, we urgently need a plan B, right, because it's just about to um, give up the ghost. Um, you know when the cover of Nature, right, this is the cover of Nature from an issue in February of 2016, says, um, beyond Moore's Law, and inside the article was actually titled, The Chips Are Down for Moore's Law, and the sort of the header on the side says, The semiconductor industry will soon abandon its pursuit of Moore's Law, and now things could get a lot more interesting. Right? So you know that something is up. So, so you know, what happens? You know, your application's too slow, your application's too power hungry, it's a billion, million, zillion lines of software, what do you do? The answer is, uh oh. Right? Maybe it's time to take a step back and think about trying something different, and plan B is let's throw transistors at it and see if something good happens. Right? So there are lots of interesting sort of you know, commercially viable um, active areas where people are building custom accelerators that are focused on tasks. So you know, perhaps you know this, perhaps you don't. If you are doing Bitcoin mining and you are actually making any money, you are doing that on a farm full of custom ASICs. Because honestly, you can't afford the power necessary to run a software farm to make enough money in Bitcoins to actually make any money. You actually have to do that with transistors today. If you are doing high frequency trading, you know, like super high frequency hedge fund stuff, that stuff is actually all running on FPGAs today. Why? Let me give you two interesting calibrating numbers. You have approximately 100 nanoseconds to decide when the trade goes by on the wire whether you want to grab it. And after you grab it, you have never more than 1,000 nanoseconds. Let me repeat, nanoseconds. 1,000 nanoseconds to compute and execute the trade while at the same time the other guys running the other hedge funds are watching your activities and possibly trying to spoof you, right? You can't do that in software. That stuff is done in hardware today. And increasingly there are interesting applications in the AI universe that are starting to be discussed as migrating into the hardware universe because it looks like the speed at which we need them to run or the form factors for power in which we need them to run would be better served if we do it with transistors. And people are in fact looking at that stuff today. And people are looking at ASICs for those things. Those things are just starting to show up. And lots of people are looking at FPGAs for those kinds of applications as FPGAs get very, very large and very, very sophisticated and start being deployed in places where this stuff actually matters. Okay, um, whoops. Um, now, you know, let's talk just a little bit about the, you know, the AI side of, you know, of, that, of that universe. Um, one of the things that's actually true these days, okay, is that, um, Machine learning algorithms have made a tremendous amount of progress in you know, recent years, right? And at a very high level, you know, what I would say is that um, the applications that we've mostly been delivering on sort of our appliances, they're good at showing us stuff, right? So we've had you know, you know, a decade or so of, of the ability to listen to music or the ability to watch a video or you know, the ability to serve websites and you know, very recently the ability to do a you know, Microsoft PowerPoint on my iPhone, you know, all, all wonderful stuff. But, not really very good at understanding stuff. It's only recently that speech has been, you know, sort of fairly, fairly successfully deployed on these things. And, you know, one of the things we're not, we're just on the, you know, on the, on the edge of is, is, you know, the ability to take out our phone, you know, aim it at, you know, aim it at the audience, right, and recognize, you know, and have, have, you know, have a text message come back that says, that's a very attractive audience of test professionals, <laughs> right? Um, you know, that's what the promise is for some of these applications. 
right? And there's a surprising amount of activity across a really wide spectrum of work here. So, you know, in the enterprise space, there are things like the Microsoft Catapult project, which is deploying really big FPGAs inside the Azure data center. So in the back of every server, there's a really big FPGA. That really big FPGA actually has connections to the top of rack router, and so it's not just one FPGA, it's an FPGA in a sea of 100,000 FPGAs with a 20 microsecond round trip flight time inside a data center. You know, what are they doing with that? The back end of Bing runs on that. They're starting to look at deep networks, right? The Google Tensor Processing Unit is kind of like a, you know, a, a GPU, but it's intended to do the sorts of computations that show up in a lot of big machine learning applications. I um, in mobile space, the Qualcomm Xeroth processor is alleged to be a learning processor that's supposed to be deployed, you know, in some mobile, you know, mobile kinds of applications. Lots and lots of stuff happening here. In fact, there's so much stuff happening here that there's actually a lot of work in hype space as well. So this is Elon Musk who made news a while ago. Elon makes lots of news for donating $10 million to keep AI from turning evil. I know I am personally happy that someone was out there to do this for us. You know, go Elon. I hope the, you know, the, the SpaceX stuff also works too. Right, so, you know, I, I, I offer this as just a cautionary note. Um, you know, be a little careful when people are telling you what the AI universe is gonna, is, gonna, is gonna be capable of, but also be optimistic. This is, you know, a really, really cool set of applications. Now, the practical reality is that machine learning is just a gigantic area, right? So saying, I'm working on machine learning is just about as definitive as saying, I'm working on math. Right? You actually have to be a little more precise in what's, in what's going on. Right? And so you know, machine learning is a very broad field with lots and lots of stuff and people doing it. So you know, maybe you're working on classification. If you're tracking any of the deep networks, the deep learning kinds of stuff, those things are classifiers. Right? Those things take high dimensional input data like every pixel in an image is one point in a million dimensional space, right? and they recognize stuff you know, like cat. Um, clustering applications are another thing that people use in machine learning and a lot of large-scale data analytics for, you know, business analytics kinds of things. Uh, of all of the things coming into Walmart or all of the things coming into Verizon, what are the buckets that we could classify these things in and figure out what's going on? Regression, if you're trying to predict the stock market or the bond market or something happening in high-frequency trading space, if you figure out what's been going on for the last 48 hours or so, can you predict what's going to go on in the next hour, right? Um, I am actually going to be talking about the stuff in the bottom right here. So uh, as, as I was uh, discussing with some of the leadership of ITC, you know, you can't actually go to a computer architecture conference or an ASIC kind of a conference without, you know, throwing a rock and hitting someone doing a chip or a chipset for deep learning, right? So I am here to offer you a breather from that, right? So I'm actually going to do a talk about not deep networks in hardware. I'm going to talk about something else in hardware. And what I'm actually going to talk about is structured prediction in hardware. And this may or may, may not be something you've ever seen before, so I'm going to talk about this for a little bit. Right? So I'm going to talk about inference on graphical models. Right? So this is a spectacularly core machine learning technique. This shows up all over the place. People do amazing things with images. People do amazing things with videos. People fold proteins. Right? You know, if you've ever seen the technologies that can you know, take um, a billion words across several million documents and you know, pull out a high level 10 word summary of the topic you know, you know, that this particular article is in so that you can index it, those things are graphical models. Right? And the way to think about this is that it's a graph, typically a gigantic graph. Right? And the nodes encode what you observe and what you know. Right? And so if you'd like to think of those things as random variables, okay, close enough. Right? And for, for ease of, of a sort of discourse in this talk, think of them as discrete land, random variables. They're things with labels. Right? So nodes, in curve, uh, nodes encode what we observe and also how much we believe that. Right? And edges encode relationships. And so if you'd like to think of those things as like joint probability relationships, that's good too. And inference can solve for answers to questions like, what's the most likely set of labels? on this graph, right? So, you know, for example, um, you know, who wants to be a green square? Who wants to be a red triangle? Who wants to be a red square? You know, maybe in this graph I, I have observed all the red nodes and I lock them down, and then I have the relationships, all of the edge relationships and node relationships every place else, and you can sort of think of this as a set of sort of highly connected um, um, probability-like affinities from which we can ask a question, if I have this graph, 
And, like it, and the graph is a constructed artifact. People get PhDs for building these things, right? And I build all of the relationships on it, and I observe some of the nodes. What do the rest of them want to be, right? That turns out to be spectacularly useful, right? And there are three great inference methods that people do to actually answer those kinds of questions. So one of the things people do is called belief propagation. In belief propagation, nodes exchange uh, messages that represent computations on the edges of the graph. They do so in an iterative manner until they converge. There's also sampling-based methods. There are things that are actually like Monte Carlo sampling, right? So if you've ever heard of something called Gibbs sampling, if you've ever heard of something called Mark uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, that's this. And the idea is we're going to throw random samples from an appropriately constructed discipline based on the structure of the graph and the relationships on the graph. And we're going to try to build models of all of those probabilities for all of those labels. And then when we're done, we'll be able to do something useful with it. And there's even a version of, of inference that's maybe a little more obscure, but still pretty famous and pretty useful, that takes a certain subset of graphical models and turns it into a network flow problem that sort of looks like the graph, but is sort of different. And you can actually solve the network flow and solve this, the, the labeling problem. Right? Now, I'm actually going to talk about belief propagation. Most of the people doing hardware these days are doing belief propagation, although there's, there are some other attempts. But belief propagation has some, just some wonderful properties to it. For, for, you know, for why it's interesting, and why it's interesting for hardware. So I am actually going to give you the world's shortest tutorial right, on belief propagation for probabilistic graphical models. So the next time you are in a cocktail party situation, right, at the end of your second tequila slammer, right, when talk necessarily turns to mark off random fields, okay, you are going to be the smartest person in the room. Okay? So, this is a probabilistic graphical model. This thing here is actually a Markov random field, right? So you already sound, sound smarter, right? Just saying Markov random field gives you a certain sense of moral superiority, right? This is a Markov random field in factor graph form, okay? There are four nodes, x1, 2, 3, and 4, the great big circles. And the x, xi take discrete values. And there are three, count them, three discrete values. And I made it three just to freak you out. Okay, doesn't have to be any number, can be 10, can be 9, right? And just to be really clear, they are circle, square, and diamond. Okay, those are the labels, right? And our goal is going to be to figure out what this graph wants to be. Right, now all of those little fees, those little blue boxes, those are things called affinity relationships, okay? So phi one, which is shown at the, at the left on there, phi one says, how much does X wanna be a red circle or a, blue, or a red square or a red diamond, okay? And the answer is, if you look on there, X one really wants to be a red square. How much does X one wanna be a red square? 10. Now, if you're thinking, I thought he was gonna talk about probabilities. I lied, okay? It's just a number, it can be any number you like. How much does X want to be a, a X1 want to be a red square? A lot, a lot more than it wants to be everything else. And if you look at the X1, X2, the phi 1, 2, that's a joint affinity, that's a joint relationship. That says things like, how much do X1 and X2 want to be, oh, let's say, two red squares? And if you sort of eyeball your way down, you'll see nine, right? But what X1 and X2 really, really want to be is two red diamonds. That's the bottom line in that. They want to be a 10, right? So people build the graph in an engineering context to solve a particular problem, and they design the labels to solve an engineering problem, and they design the edges and the affinity relationships on the edges, right, and on the nodes, so that the solution to the problem they want, you know, does something useful in a practical context. All right, so next kind of popping up one level, what's the affinity of the whole graph for a set of labels? It's like, like how much does this graph want to be square, square, circle, diamond? All right, so if you just look left to right under the circles, how much does this graph want to be square, square, circle, diamond, right? And the answer is you just multiply out all the affinities, right? And you put in all of the appropriate values for the node. So you put in phi 1 gets a square because x one's a square, and you put in phi 1, 2 um, gets a square and a square because both of those things are squares, and you multiply that all, that all number out, and that's how much that graph wants to be square, square, circle, diamond. Okay, so far so good. Right? But this isn't probabilities. And one of the things I told you early on is that one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to ask questions like, 
what is the most probable set of labels, right? So how do you get probabilities from this? Well, the easy answer is that you normalize this thing. So you normalize this product so that when you add up everything that can happen on the graph, you get a one. Right? And so the nice straightforward answer is you build this thing on the bottom, which is the sum over every possible value of the product, over every possible way you can label the graph, and you make a number. And the number is called z. It's got a fancy name. It's called the partition function, which turns out to be a thing from physics because this looks a lot like things people do in physics. Right? And when you normalize this this way, this thing that I'm showing you here is in fact the probability of any way this graph can be labeled. But you have to think for a minute, right? Okay, look, you know, there's four nodes here. Nobody does things with four nodes. Four million nodes, four billion nodes, right? There's gonna have to be some more magic happening here. All right, so we can now actually talk about sort of the classical task that I wanna talk about doing in hardware, which is MAP inference, maximum a posteriori inference. What is the most probable set of labels for the graph? Right, this is what I'd like to solve for. And I can at least write the equation the equation is the biggest value of that thing, that thing in the parentheses, right? Arg max over all of the values of the nodes, whatever that thing is, right? Whatever makes that thing the biggest number, that's the most, that's the most likely thing. That's the thing this graph really wants to be. And like I said earlier, people engineer these graphs as, as you know, constructed artifacts so that things like the map inference answer solves some interesting engineering problem. Right? So how do people actually do this stuff? Well, you know, it's argmax, right? Um, the first thing is, hey, z's a constant. If I'm taking the maximum, I don't care, which is great because it was intractable to calculate anyway, right? So wham, that thing goes away. And so, hey, I'm back to the product of the 10s and the 9s and the 17s, right? Um, and this thing is actually has a fancy name. This is sometimes called the unnormalized probability, okay? Right? And then, because some truths are universal, and just like in digital signal processing, nobody likes a multiplier, but everybody likes an adder, right? You take the logs of everything here, right? And you typically do negative log, and it turns out that that's a thing from statistical physics, right? And if I take like, you know, a half a step back, I'm showing you nodes, and I'm showing you edges, and I'm showing you affinity relationships, and I'm talking about probabilities, but maybe I could be talking about atoms, and maybe I could be talking about magnetic moments, and maybe I could be talking about spin up and spin down, and you know, that's actually statistical physics. Like there's, there's a whole math there from that stuff. So we do this math thing from statistical physics, and we get another formula which frankly, which uh, friendly enough doesn't have any multiplies in it, it's adding a bunch of stuff up. And because we put a negative in front of the log sign, it's a now a min, right? And this thing has a fancy name, this is the energy function for the Markov random field. Right? And our whole goal in life now is to minimize energy. And we all know that we feel warm and special when we minimize energy. Right? It's a good thing. It's good in everybody's discipline, even for mathematics and statistical physics. So this is the minimum energy formulation of maximum a posteriori inference right, on a Markov random field. If you can say that after the second tequila slammer, you are already in a position of vast moral authority right, in all of your social interactions. Right? How do you actually solve that beast, right? How you don't do it on the first line of this slide. You don't build the full joint distribution. You don't go like write down that whole thing with a billion fees or a billion thetas in it. That's just not happening. The way you do this is completely locally and completely iteratively. You do this with something called belief propagation. And belief propagation in the one line version of things, it's all about local message passing. It's a smart ordering of computations from one end of the graph to the other that pushes appropriate information from the past in the graph to the future in the graph, walking along the edges of the graph. So if anybody is from the side of the computing or electrical engineering universe where you've ever heard of something called Viterbi, right, on something like a hidden Markov model, that's this, right? But Viterbi is a special case of a bigger thing. Right? So what happens is, right, every node is going to compute a message and it's going to send it out on a particularly appropriately chosen set of links. So there are messages coming into the node, in this case from the left, this is from the past in the graph that encode useful information, and we're going to calculate some stuff, and the stuff involves the things happening at the node. 
right? It involves those phi's and those thetas, and it also involves information from the past. That's the red thing at the far right here, that sum over all the m's. That's the messages that came into me, right? And just to make this complicated, there's a minimum in here. And just to make this even more complicated, this isn't a number, right? This isn't a scalar. This is a vector. This is a thing computed for every possible value of the labels, right? This tiny little example I showed you got three labels, right? You know, real kinds of examples, thousand labels, million labels, right? You know, things, things can get complicated really fast, and you actually have to compute something for every label value. Right? The thing that's wonderful about this belief propagation algorithm is that once you compute the messages walking one way through the graph, you can walk backwards through the graph and you compute something called beliefs. And beliefs are, they're sort of just what you think they are. They are, how much do I actually think this labels the right final answer? So you can think of that as sort of like the, the most likely. Right? So in this case, it's the minimum number because of this negative log action that we did. Right? So the messages go backwards, and once you've, got, once, you've got the, sorry, once you've got the messages computed one way through the graph, you can compute the beliefs, and once you've got the beliefs computed for every possible label, you can take one big step back and say, will the most likely label please stand up? And you can say, what's the most likely set of labels on the whole graph? Right? And you know, there's a sort of a good news, bad news thing here. If the graph that I give you, if the Markov random field that I give you is a chain or a tree, Right? Belief propagation converges. One, two passes. One pass down the graph, the chain or the tree, one pass up, wham, all the beliefs, bam, you're done. You can interrogate, you can say, what's the most likely values? It's a wonderful thing. It's such a wonderful thing, we gave someone a Turing Award for it. Right? That's you to Pearl. Right? Way, way back in the 80s, when there were expert systems and rule-based systems and all kinds of sort of mathematically dicey approaches to building things about, you know, um, knowledge and labels and beliefs and interactions, you know, he stood up and said, you know what, I think the language of probability will actually let us do this stuff if we just figure out how to make it work. And this was one of the things that he came up with for how to make it work. So this is super famous, right? really super famous. Thank you, you know, Dr. Pearl. And you know, it would be wonderful if there was only a left-hand side of this slide and we could all go home. Right? Um, and the answer is, sorry, because if the graph has any loops, there's no guarantees of any convergence at all. Whoops. Right? And this has a, a wonderful funky name. This is loopy belief propagation. Okay? And you know, the, the sort of the problem is, is, you know, in this sort of message passing thing, you know, here's a node. I've got a little sort of a, a loop with four nodes here. It's like node B says, um, this is what I believe about my labels to node C. And node C says, this is what I, you know, and, and, and this is what I think you should do to node C. And node C says, okay, this is what I now believe about my labels. This is what I think you should do to D. D says, this is what I believe about my labels. This is what you should do. E, uh, e says, you know, the same thing and sends it back. And you basically what happens is you get conflicting information by asking all of your friends what they think of you, right? And sometimes it converges, as shown in the graph on the bottom, where we're looking for that minimum energy thing, right, that was the most likely labels. Sometimes it converges. To the right answer, sometimes it converges to a local minimum, which is okay, but maybe not the best answer, actually almost never the best answer. Sometimes it oscillates wildly and unpleasantly. And there's a gigantic literature for sort of ways to tame this. Nobody's got a sort of a, a, a perfect way to tame this, but there are sort of things that make this sort of manageable, right? So this is the thing I wanna talk about putting in hardware. Now, the other thing is like, what applications am I gonna look at? And I'm gonna look at some, some, for the moment, relatively small applications from um, a famous uh, set of benchmarks. So this is the Middlebury Suite. These are the guys who did it, Charstein and Zielinski did the Middlebury Suite. Middlebury is to inference what spec and spec mark is to computer architecture. These are the tests you run. There's a bunch of tests from a bunch of uh, science and engineering domains, and everybody, and you know, there, there are problems in here that have exact perfect answers. Many of them are synthetic, some of them are real. This is where you go look. All right, so we're gonna be looking at stuff from the Middlebury Benchmark Suite. And the first thing we picked is stereo matching. And um, this is actually a sort of a cool problem, right? So imagine you have a camera that actually has two lenses, right? So, you know, like, like human eyes, binocular vision, and you get a left image and a right image. Okay, and imagine that you take a line, a row of pixels in say the left-hand image, right? The question that we want to ask is, for any pixel in the left-hand image, which one is it in the right-hand image? 
right? And the reason we want to do that is that if something is very, very far away from the camera, it's going to be at basically the same place in the left and right image. And if something is very, very close to the two lenses of the camera, it's going to be very, very far separated. Okay? It's going to have what's referred to as a large disparity. If we can calculate the disparity for every single pixel, how far is it displaced in the two images, we can calculate something that we can use as a surrogate for 3D depth. Okay? And that's actually a very interesting technology because there's lots of things in which we do not want to actually have an active source that's pinging something with LIDAR or radar or something like that, where we'd actually just like to have cameras getting 3D depth information um, passively with pixels coming at us. Right? And so it turns out that this is a lovely Markov random field MAP inference problem. You build one big graph. The graph has a node for every single pixel. The pixels are connected north, south, east, and west. You can build information about individual um, affinity relationships for each node, um, relationships for affinity relationships for the, the things between the edges. You use the two images that you capture from the cameras as the start of that. You run inference on it, and the thing you get out, the labels are these disparities. You can think of them as depth, right? So there's not as many labels as there are in, say, an RGB image, but you know, the labels are basically correlated with how far away is that, right? And so it's a, lovely famous it's a lovely famous graphical model. There's lots and lots of things that we can compare it to. And honestly, in the space of inference, this is hello world. This really is. This is the first thing everybody does. So this is the first thing we did, okay? So, um, we're doing a particular kind of belief propagation in hardware, which is called sequential tree reweighted, and I'm going to give you the one slide version. And the idea is that you take a graph with a lot of loops, and look, this is a graph of pixels, right? It's nothing but loops. And you decompose it into a set of trees. And in this case, we're going to decompose it into a set of chains, and you run inference sequentially across the decoupled chains. Right? And so the way this thing works is that you actually decompose it into a set of horizontal chains that run down the rows. So we're going to solve the inference problem on the rows precisely, but without any you know, stuff going on in the columns. And then we're going to solve it on the columns without any stuff going on in the rows. And then there's a little bit of fancy math that sort of glues these things together in an appropriate way. Right? And the math is fancy because it has the guarantee that um, this particular sort of inference won't oscillate. Now, that doesn't mean it gets the right answer. That just means that every time you run it, it won't get worse, right? which is a lovely, lovely sort of a, sort of a thing. But there's a sort of a problem, which is that it has this very sequential kind of a character, which is that I'm running the chains in one direction, right? and then I'm running the chains in the other direction, and then I'm gluing them together. And it turns out that if we want to do hardware that's as parallel as we can possibly make it, this is not the best architecture. So we implemented a trick that's, that's reasonably well known and fairly famous for people who do uh, you know, sort of dense matrix kinds of stuff in high performance computing. Um, we did, a, we did a, something called a diagonal ordering. Right? And the basic idea is don't process the pixels in the rows, don't process the pixels in columns, process the diagonals. So the first, let me go backwards, the first diagonal is, um, the first diagonal is number one, the next diagonal is two and three, the next diagonal is four, five, and six. And if you just look at the diagonal, here's the thing to notice. Remember I said that in, mess in, in belief propagation, the messages come from one side of the graph and go to the other side of the graph. You have to process all the stuff in the past before you can process the stuff in the future. If you process things in diagonal order, all of the messages from the past in the rows and all of the messages from the past in the columns are already done. Right? And so everything in the diagonal can be done totally in parallel. Right? This exposes about as much parallelism as you can pull out of this thing you know, in, in sort of you know, one row or column level of, uh, of stuff. And so we built a streaming architecture for this. Right? It's a decoupled architecture, which means it's got a big blob of hardware that manages the DRAM and pulls the diagonals out, and another blob of hardware that manages writing them back and sort of does all the reordering stuff. Um, it's a pipeline. And so it launches and retires one pixel per clock in the Markov random field, one node of the Markov random field. And if you're thinking, that doesn't sound like a lot of work. Pixels, really small thing, you know, green, red, you know, sometimes gray. So no, no, no. This is the Markov random field. We're retiring all of the beliefs for all of the labels on one of those nodes in one shot. 
right? So this thing is about a kilobit worth of stuff being computed every clock tick. It's a 14 stage deep pipeline, so there's 14 pixels in flight with all of their beliefs being retired every single clock tick. And so we built it, and we built it on an FPGA, and here is just a live video, you know, of left camera, right camera, um, it's very hard to see the differences between the two cameras with your naked eye, but that's a depth map being sort of done completely in hardware on the right. Um, we did this in uh, 2012, we published it in 2013. It's running on four Xilinx FPGAs and a Xeon that's doing some housekeeping kind of stuff. Um, when we published this, this was like the fastest BP anything any, anybody had ever done. You know, it was faster than software, faster than GP, it was even faster than some ASICs, which suggests that you know, if you build the architecture right, you know, good things can happen. But, you know, everybody has a first thumping, and you need to get beyond sort of hello world. And so here's the big criticism of everybody everywhere who does accelerators. You know, they make wonderful PhD theses, right? They're incredibly fun. Um, you get invited to do keynotes at interesting conferences in interesting places, right? But they're kind of narrow, right? And the problems with that particular architecture, the stereo architecture, was that it was not configurable to do anything else. Right, I mean, it's like, that was the only thing that it could possibly do, right? Um, and it was pipeline, but it was not scalable and it was not parallel, okay? And so, in particular, what you couldn't do with it was add another sort of pipeline stage or some other kind of a processor and make it go better, right? It was, you know, it was kind of as good as you could go. What we could do is we could make it wider, we could make it do more labels at one time, but, you know, that's, that's not very exciting. And it was using memory bandwidth in a spectacularly inefficient way because it was highly optimized to be pulling out a chunk of memory from streaming DRAM, from bursting DRAMs um, that was a particular size, in this case a 16 label set size. And God forbid you had 17 labels or 19 labels or 31 labels, right, or actually 33 labels, right? It was extremely inefficient. So we took a step back and said, all right, look, we have to do something better here. And so we built a better architecture. So our version two architecture is still doing belief propagation in an iterative manner, okay? But it's a scalable architecture and it's a configurable architecture. So, all right, what exactly does that mean? It's not just a pipeline anymore, it's actually processors, right? Now we are still deploying the processors and scheduling the processors so they run the diagonal. So that little sort of you know, black box on the left-hand side you know, the orange, the yellow pixel, the green pixel, and the purple pixel, it's, you know, we're still doing diagonals, but we can actually now throw more processors at this thing, and if you have more processors, you actually get more speed, right? It also has a new memory subsystem that is you know, grabbing things in more intelligently scheduled chunks, um, and because it's actually separate processors and not a pipeline, you can actually have uh, computations interfering with each other, and it manages all the hazards, you know, automatically in a reasonably smart way. And it's also got an interesting configurable unit that can manage all of those affinities, those phi things and those theta things. There's a way of configuring it so that you can do more than one problem. So let me talk a little bit about sort of the, you know, down in the, down in, you know, down in the details of, of this stuff. So let's be precise about what it means to be configurable. Um, it's not programmable. There's no Python compiler for this thing, right? Um, you can't write MATLAB and just hit a button and have, have this thing go. It's configurable, which means, you know, for a certain set of applications, there's a restricted set of mathematical forms for all of the stuff in those Markov random fields. They only show up in a certain restricted universe of forms. We implemented those things in hardware, so those things are basically parameterized so that we can implement things, right? So those fees only come in a certain set of flavors for a wide range of applications. So if you go to the left-hand side of the slide, let me just like, you know, talk about one of these things. So there's a little big red arrow there that says phi 1, 2, right? Theta x1, x2, right? Um, you know, for most image processing kinds of problems, the relationships on the edges are things called smoothness costs. And the smoothness cost says, you know what? If I'm a green pixel, I probably want the guy next to me to also be a green pixel. Right? And so the cost of green next to green is relatively low. But if this guy's a green pixel and this guy's a red pixel, this is relatively expensive. Okay? How much expensive? Well, it depends on the form factor, and that's what those graphs are. So, you know, the, the, the sort of the straight line says it's linearly more expensive, right? So if I'm a red pixel and you're a blue pixel, um, 
I hate you, actually that sounds like politics, um, right? The, the, the more distant you are from me in terms of your color, right, the more I dislike you, right? And my dislike is unbounded, actually much like politics, um, and you know, it's unbounded. Um, but there are other versions of this that say, for example, the ones on the right that say, um, the more different you get, I dislike you up until a point of maximum disgust and then, yeah, the hell with it, you know? I don't, I don't, I don't hate you anymore. Right? And these are engineered artifacts. People design these things so that they get answers that work. And so there's the linear version, and there's the sort of the, you know, the, 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 the constant bounded linear one, and there's the exponential one, and you know, we implemented all this stuff. We, we built all of this stuff in hardware, and you can just parameterize it, and you can use it. Okay, so, right. so that, you know, I mean, that's a hardware guy's, you know, approach to the universe. There's only 20 ways people implement that formula, fine. I will, put, I will throw NAND gates at it, and that's what we did, all right? But there's another really deeply unfortunate fact here, which is that a bunch of the computations down deep in those messages and beliefs are quadratic in the number of labels. <coughs> Excuse me. So remember, one of the things that's getting calculated on the messages and beliefs right, is a minimum. And it's the minimum over everything that could happen on another node that you're connected to that you have a relationship with, right? And so it's terrible because for every label on this node, for every label on the node you are connected to, you have to answer what's the best thing, what's the, like if you will, what's the belief I am this label if you are that label? It's an intrinsically quadratic thing and for large label scenarios, it's a nasty thing. Right? So we implemented another trick, and it's a trick that's a um, moderately well-known trick in just the math side of the universe, but I think this is the first time anybody did it in a sort of a high-performance computing scenario. There's a trick called jump flooding, right? And um, the way, I'm not gonna explain any of the nitty-gritty of it other than to say, it's kind of like a fast Fourier transform, right? You know, the Fourier transform, if you'd implement it stupid, is quadratic. Right? If you organize the computations in a very clever kind of way, you can get it sort of n log n, right? Um, jump flooding is the same kind of thing. If you organize the computations of what you compare to what in a very clever way, you can make it faster, but the big thing that's different, why it's not like a fast Fourier transform, is this is an approximation, right? You can't actually get the exact right answer right, in anything less than quadratic time, but if you take advantage of the fact that all of those cost functions are generally monotone, non-decreasing, like the more different you are, the more I dislike you. You can take advantage of sort of like what values across the spectrum of the x-axis do you actually have to calculate? And it turns out the answer is a lot less of them. So we have this very fancy um, uh, three-stage pipeline configurable unit which for a large set of label scenarios can calculate things in an n log n or L log L for L labels kind of a way. And there's a graph there for one of our examples. There's two lines that are indistinguishable from each other showing you belief propagation iterations, right? You know, back and forth across the graph, back and forth across the graph, right? Showing the energy, this sort of thing that's the surrogate for the you know, most likely labels. And you know, basically, this is the difference between fast and not fast. So this works really, really well. So we have nice scalability results on this thing. So we have, um, in this case, we have two and four processing elements currently actually running. This is a graph. Everybody who does anything in sort of a high performance hardware space has to have a graph like this. The horizontal axis says how many, how many parallel processors do you have? And the vertical axis says how long do you think it's gonna run? And this is a simulation. The blue line is a simulation. And the blue line says, hold your breath, if I could feed this thing from the memory subsystem, this is how fast it could go, All right? So, this is how fast it could go. If I can feed it, we built two of these. We built a two processor and a four processor version, and yeah, pretty good. Um, and we actually um, built an eight processor version. It fits, but you, you guys will appreciate this. We could not close the timing, okay? So I'm confident that it would actually be there if I could route the damn thing, right? Uh, we have uh, just acquired some much bigger FPGAs now. Right? But, so what does that actually look like? Well, um, here's a bunch of examples. Um, so this is with four processors running at 150 megahertz, um, 12 to 40x faster than software, right? So these are three uh, benchmarks in rows. The top row is an object segmentation benchmark. I give you an image and I ask you to identify the pixels, things like sky, cloud, metal, wood, grass, stuff like that. And you know, there's that you know, red and green blob thing in the middle. Um, 
That's the exact right answer, and we've got a grayscale version of that on the right, and it's like, oh, you know, we're actually doing okay. Um, the image denoising one is an interesting one. You take an image and you just take a big chunk, out of, a chunk of it out. That's what the big black blobs are. You just make it go away, and then you say, hey, based on what's in the neighborhood, can you reconstruct the image? And what you get is a kind of a blurry version of the house with a little blurry corner of the edge and stuff like that. That's working okay. And then we also did the TRW, uh, we, we also did a TRWS version of the stereo matching, and it works. Right, so you know, roughly 10 to, you know, 10 to 40x faster um, over conventional software. And interestingly enough, this is the first hard, custom hardware ever to run more than one of the Middlebury benchmarks which just says how much work it is to make one of these things run, right? let alone building something that you can run several things on. So you know, we feel pretty good about this. But at the end of the day, as well as being you know, you know, hardware kinds of people, we're also silicon kinds of people. So there's actually another part of this story. All right, so let me talk about the, oops, you know, the next part. Um, so hardware relief propagation has even some more advantages, which is kind of cool. Right? So everybody in this room knows this. I give versions of this talk in front of broader audiences and sometimes AI audiences, and so this is the, really, are you kidding me? You know, kind of a slide. Look, you know, when the basic switch is like 100 atoms wide, nothing is deterministic anymore, right? Every chip behavior you're interested in is a little smear of probability, right? So what do we know? We know that every wafer that pops out of the fab, you know, is different. We know that every chip on every wafer that pops out of the fab is different, and if we took out our little you know, ITC magnifying glass and we looked at the NAND gates in the bottom left corner and the NAND gates in the top right corner, we would be able to say that even those things are different, right? So it's just a, a, a basket of deplorable probabilities right, for these things, right? It's bad, right? And so we have a new interesting problem, a new interesting opportunity, um, which is, thank you, um, Um, what can we say about the resilience of these kinds of applications in the face of what will necessarily be um, a stochastic fabric? Now, everybody in this room is incredibly aware of the fact that you know, people in the design community spend a lot of time making sure that end users don't see this stuff, right? But lots of people in this room spend a lot of time getting fairly close to the edge of this stuff and trying to you know, pull some performance out of the fact that this weird stuff is going on, and maybe something good can happen here. So you know, let's just sort of talk about this a little bit. Um, the first thing that I can offer to you is that belief propagation is already, just by its very nature, um, quite resilient. And, and you know, it, it, it makes sense when you think about this iterative character, right? So you know, here's the sort of scenario. You do a computation and a node says, I believe I'm a red square. And it communicates to its friends, right? And its friends compute and send a message back and says, no, you're an orange triangle, right? And the node, which is maybe, you know, it's got a timing fault or a, you know, a bit flip or something, says, no, you know, I am a red square. And because of this iterative character, your neighbors basically come into your apartment, stage an intervention, and say, no, I'm sorry, you are not a red square. I don't care what you think, you know. So you can actually fix some of this stuff just because of this uh, consulting your neighbors kind of a business. But it turns out it's good, but it's not good enough to actually make things really work if the fabric you're running on has lots of weird stuff happening in it. And so we've been investigating some um, noise tolerance kinds of techniques. So there's a broad spectrum of techniques called algorithmic noise tolerance due to my friend Nuresh Schonbog at the University of Illinois. Um, there's a very fancy diagram here, but let me sort of try to, try to explain this at a very high level. We're gonna compute this thing normally with a big you know, data path with you know, lots of arithmetic stuff in it. That's the block called main. But we're also gonna compute it again in a very lightweight manner. And in particular, we're gonna compute a very low resolution version of the same answer, right? Not a lot of bits, not super accurate, right? Just like a high order bit, you know, a very, very lightweight version of this computation running exactly on the side of the original computation. And then we're gonna do the following. We're gonna compute both of them at the same time and we're going to compare them all the time, every single time, for every single computation. And we're gonna say the following. If those two results, the big high precision result, the big green bar, and the little tiny low precision result, if those two things look like they are about the same number, which means they are like the same size, we're going to say that the main block is okay, right? Because we did it twice, and we got sort of the same answer, and we're gonna say great, and we're gonna send that one out. But if those two things, the big green block and the little green block, are very, very different, we are going to assume that the big green block screwed up. Why? One, because there's more of it. 
And the likelihood that the error is there is bigger because there's more of it. And also because it's doing full precision arithmetic and all those carry chains and things tend to be the places that bad things happen for timing. That's where something bad happened as opposed to my tiny little four bit carry chain, right? So we're just gonna substitute this little crappy answer in, right, on the side, everywhere for every computation that we've got, okay? That sounds deceptively straightforward, right? Um, how well does that actually work? Okay, let me show you. <clears throat> so this is a live camera connected to a live FPGA running real live belief prop iterative belief propagation in hardware. So at the top left, the left image, the top right, the right image of this camera. On the left hand side, I am showing you the depth map being computed in real time, okay? Um, I slightly slower than real time, um, um, with errors. So what are the errors in it? Um, we actually didn't close the timing. We actually built this thing, we ran it through all of the synthesis stuff on the FPGA side, and we just said, no, thank you. We did not close the timing. So when it says synthetic errors in hardware, what that really means is this cannot ever work, right? And the image on the far, on the bottom right, right, is the same hardware, but it's got the checking stuff turned on. And what you can see is that the image on the bottom left is crap. Right, and the image on the bottom right, which is exactly the same hardware whose long paths in the main block cannot possibly work, right, much of the time, an unknown fraction of the time, but the checker stuff occasionally being inserted when those paths screw up, and you get a perfectly nice 3D, you know, reconstructed version. This is my erstwhile graduate student, Jungwook Choi, who is the author of all of the really neat stuff in this, in this uh, work. He's at IBM TJ Watson right now. Right, so not super high resolution 3D, right? Not super high resolution, but all running in hardware, and in particular, all running in broken hardware, right, which is, uh, I think, pretty interesting. Boba Fett action, you can tell when we did this video. The next one's coming out shortly, right? So, now, one final result, right? Um, all of the things we did to make this um, a resilient design, you know, a lower power, um, also make this a lower power design. So, you know, just a reminder for anybody who's not working on this side of the universe, right? The iron law of power, right? There's dynamic power because things are switching, CV squared F kind of power, right? There's leakage power, just, you know, V times I, you know, kind of a power. And even though we have better transistors than we used to have, they still leak a little bit, right? So nothing is perfect. Um, what do you do to actually make the power go down? Well, you know, there's an entire industry about that. But one of the big things you do is you try to run it as low a low voltage as you possibly can. Um, what happens when you run it at too low a voltage? Well, bad things, right? Noise margins go to hell in your, in you know, in all of your logic. Um, your ability to be tolerant of the substrate or the power supply bouncing around gets problematic. Paths that are a little too long get a little too longer and you start missing events on clock edges, right? Things kind of break. So it's nice if you can lower the power, but it's often, it's often lower the voltage, but it's often difficult. Um, you know what? Um, all of the stuff that we did for resilience also works fabulously to just let you take the clock, I'm sorry, let you take the voltage way, way down. Right, so all of the ant mechanisms that fix stuff also let you take the voltage down. So this is just that example. There are three columns of data here. There's the error-free version of the data, which is on the far left. There's the dumb version, which is that thing with the, with the, um, um, with the paths, right, you know, um, uh, without any of the checker hardware on it. And there's a resilient version. And we just drop the voltage by a quarter of a volt. And the, the little percentage numbers are called BPRs, bad pixel ratios. They just say how much is screwing up relative to the right answer. And the answer is, um, in the resilient version of the hardware, you can drop the power by, in this case, a quarter of a volt on a, on a you know, not particularly aggressive 45 nanometer um, technology. You can get something close to a 50% power win, and you can't see anything, you know, like one third of a percent more bad, more bad pixels. Right? So this is another nice example of things from the sort of the hardcore double E, you know, VLSI, uh, you know, resilient chip, you know, side of the world, like, you know, coming back into these interesting applications like AI applications and being able to do something good. All right, so um, 
I think that uh, you know, machine learning in, in you know, accelerators, machine learning in FPGAs, machine learning in custom hardware, it's gonna be a really interesting thing. It's been academically challenging. I've been doing this since around, I don't know, 2010. I think I'm, we've been having a lot of fun doing this. It seems to be increasingly industrially relevant. I think that's gonna be a very significant thing when, when FPGAs start to appear in the data center at scale. You know, if you can call up Amazon or you can call up Azure, you know, and get 100,000 FPGAs, that's gonna be interesting for doing this kind of stuff at scale. And there's a whole other side of this universe that's taking the technology and building it under the hood inside chips in, in ways that are not consumer facing, you know, to try to learn things and heal things and other kinds of things. That's also another side. It's just not what this talk is about. Um, there's lots and lots of interest in this kind of work. So, you know, a thank you to everybody who was nice to me, gave me data, you know, funded, you know, funded this kind of work. Um, and so that's the, that's the sort of the high level version of the, um, of the machine learning um, accelerator talk. So I wanted to do you know, one you know, kind of small epilogue, right, since this is a, a session in, in, in honor of, of somebody important um, as we transition toward that. Um, you know, it feels like we're in an, in, in, in an interesting era of endings, right? We are seeing the passing of some titanic forces, you know, in the industry. I am a child of the VLSI revolution, you know, the Mead and Conway book that said, to those of you too young to know this, you too, young student, can build a chip, right? That was not a thing in the 1970s. That was a thing in the 1980s. That was the thing that determined the next 30 some years of my personal career and probably many other people in this room, right? Moore's Law has been a thing that's been driving us for you know, approximately a half a century and you know, it's about to kind of give it up, right? And at the same time, we are also seeing, sadly, the passing of some giant individuals, you know, in this universe, and in particular, the, the sad passing of Ed, you know, who passed away here. So I was going to do, before we sort of transition to um, some other folks who knew Ed, you know, well, um, you know, I was going to give my one, my one Ed anecdote. All right, so those of you who know me know that I have been teaching CAD and VLSI stuff for a really long time. Right, but in particular, this, one of the things I've been doing for the past couple of years is I've been doing it at planetary scale. I've been doing massive open online courses on this stuff on the Coursera platform. Right, so in the fall of 2011, you know, there were a bunch of interesting experiments on the West Coast from our friends at Stanford. You know, the AI course, machine learning course, um, a databases course. Um, that immediately spun up an ecosystem of platform providers, Coursera, edX, Udacity. Um, some interesting things. I've been doing a, um, a VLSI CAD course there since 2013. Um, it took a hiatus last year uh, when my friends at Coursera changed the foundational plat software platform and broke all of my homework assignments. Right, welcome to the real world. So I'm in the middle of transitioning that stuff over. But it's been a it's been a very exciting you know kind of a you know kind of a thing. Now for those of you you know who are you know, any of you who are buying into the meme that like this is a really tough industry and you know things are going away and you know all this kind of stuff. The, the example that I like to give just from my particular experience of teaching this MOOC is I want to give you two numbers. There are approximately 25,000 EDA professionals on the planet and 51,602 of them have signed up for my course. Okay, so um, there are reasons to be positive about the about the future, right? It's a it's a you know, once you, you know, you, you take the shackles off the course from being, you know, in a classroom, in a university, you know, on a campus, and you let people do this at a sort of a planetary scale, you know, interesting things happen. One of the things that, you know, that sometimes happens when I, when I come and talk about this stuff is people come up and want to take selfies with me. That never happened when I was just a CAD guy, <laughs> right? right? And the, the interesting touch point on this is that, you know, I've been teaching logic stuff for 30 some years. I've been teaching design for 30 some years. I've been teaching VLSI and ASIC stuff. I've been teaching computer architecture. I've been teaching CAD. And you know what? For the last 30 or so years, this has been my constant companion, right? So for those of you who don't recognize it, this is the book Ed did in 1986, right? This is, this was a big deal when it came out. I have no idea if this thing is still in print, right? The fact that this thing has like yellow sticky notes all over it that are of 20 some years old, right, tells you how often I look at it. This is the place you go if you want to find out an evil homework problem involving multiplexers, right, or NAND gates, or bizarre decompositions, right, or if you really, really wanted to know the third decimal point stuff in the Quine-McCluskey, 
you know, kinds of stuff, and why it was complicated, and anything involving sensitization, and you know all those weird formulas for Boolean difference and stuff? Who remembers that stuff, right? This has been a spectacularly important book, and you know, I've had about a billion books in this universe, right? But this is honestly the one that's been like next to my desk for the last 30 years, and I, unfortunately, I never really got a chance to thank Ed for this one. So this is my, my, you know, my very short homage. Thanks, Ed. This has been, you know, tremendously helpful as I have actually been, you know, been teaching this kind of stuff. So look, Ed was an interesting guy. Ed was a guy with many hats. We know this because the internet has a page that's filled with pictures of Ed wearing many hats, right? He was a visionary, he was a leader, he was a friend, he was a colleague, he was an extraordinary mentor and advisor to a lot of my good friends. He was an interesting guy. He is absolutely going to be deeply missed and I am incredibly honored and privileged to be here giving you Edward J. McCluskey Memorial Talk, right, at ITC. And so um, with that, I'm just going to say thank you to the ITC committee for inviting me. Thank you to the audience and just thank you. <laughs>